this is my attempt at audience participation. So it's a pleasure to be here. I certainly want to thank the, uh, the Congress organizers and uh, you know, I have many, many good friends in, in Brazil and it's great to, to see them and I appreciate the opportunity to come and be with Carlos and talk about him, about some of our collaborative efforts as well as some of the challenges that are faced uh, here in Brazil relative to, to bacterial infections. I wanted to take a few minutes this morning to talk about some of the PKPD uh, opportunities uh, that you may, may have and perhaps introduce a, a few new concepts to consider. You have some new medicines that are here in Brazil and so this is going to be an increasing opportunity for you to apply some of these techniques uh, to these medicines and ultimately to your, to your patients. Let me see if this will go. Is the slide moving? Ah, wonderful, wonderful. So in the context of infectious diseases, it's a pretty simple, simple equation. You know, we have three factors that are predominant and that drive our overall outcomes. And the goal for us in the management of patients is, I suspect, very similar to your goal. Make people well as quickly and efficiently as possible. And we're trying to maximize the probability of success. This is our goal. And, and we appreciate the, the impact of the host, some severe illness in patients, underlying comorbidities, medical, surgical managements that compromise patients. We certainly understand many of you not only being infectologists, but knowing about the clinical microbiology. Appreciate the challenges with the bugs, that the names are very similar, but the flavors of these bugs have become increasingly challenging relative to resistance. And the point that we try to make quite often is that as clinicians, we don't get a chance to pick the patient and we don't get a chance to pick the bug. But one of the modifiable factors is the way we administer the medication. So not only the name of it, but how you deliver it to your patients has the opportunity to increase the probabilities of success. And when we talk about success, we think about S. Right? If the clinical microbiology laboratory gives you a report, you like to see S's, right? S is good. I is I don't know. I'm going to call somebody else. And R is that's generally bad. So S equals success. And you will see an improvement in clinical and microbiologic outcomes. This is good. But one of the main challenges that we face now is that these bugs were not quite as susceptible as they used to be, okay? And I, I passed my disclosures quickly, I apologize, but I'm also on the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute. So this is the group that makes the global decisions about how SINR are defined. And I can tell you that, that we struggle to make sure that people understand how S is defined. And as the bugs become more, more, more tolerant to antibiotics, we're also beginning to see data like this. And these data are not new. These are older data. These are patients that have, quote unquote, susceptible bugs, appropriate therapy, the right antibiotic, but yet S does not equal success. This is mortality. So why is it that these patients are not doing well? Well, sometimes it's because the host is so compromised. Increasingly, we're finding out, and I think you all appreciate the importance of delayed therapy. It's important to get it right early, especially in somebody who's critically ill. And we know this is not one day, two day, three day. We're talking about hours to get it right. So making good decisions about appropriate empiric therapy is important. But we're also beginning to recognize with great frequency that inadequate doses, or maybe more appropriately put, inadequate exposures 
are also increasingly responsible for poor outcomes. And so these are some data that you may be familiar with. These are data from my colleagues in, in uh, the a APAC region that they have looked at a multi-center trials and they've collected some samples from patients who are critically ill and they were good enough to assess the drug concentrations in many of these patients. And what they found for beta-lactams, not surprisingly, what they found for things like vancomycin, and a little bit surprising to many people, I think, was that not only were we doing a pretty bad job with, with antibacterials relative to getting the right exposure, but also antifungal agents are also an opportunity and an area for PKPD optimization. And you can imagine that, you know, if somebody's starting on a fungal, they probably already had an antibacterial. Now they got a fungal, they're probably pretty sick. Getting it right is increasingly important. And so there have been a variety of different, uh, you know, opportunities to increase exposure. And many antibiotics, the glycopeptides fit into this realm, vancomycin, tycoplanin, daptomycin, and tigacycline. These are all antibiotics that are driven by the overall exposure, so the AUC to MIC. And a very, very easy way to think about maximizing the PKPD profile is simply to increase the dose. But we have to understand the opportunities with PKPD pharmacodynamics versus, versus toxicodynamics. And agents like daptomycin we're finding are very safe agents and you can push the doses very high. And just recently at the January meeting of the, I mean June meeting of the CLSI, we actually approved new breakpoints for DAPTO and enterococci. And we advocate doses of 8 to 12 milligram per kilo for those enterococci with MICs of 2 to 4. So we want to encourage people to use the right dose for higher MICs to drive that. Some of the other agents, you know, are, 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 are more challenging. So agents like the fluoroquinolones, and agents like linazolid, because they have toxicities, we're not able to push the doses very well, okay? And you know this is a huge challenge with gram-negative resistance and quinolones. The MICs go very high, and so we can't optimize the PKPD profile. With a drug like linazolid, the 600 milligram dose is something we've advocated for more than a decade is actually quite good relative to optimizing the exposures for staphylococci, including methicillin-resistant staph. So there's no reason to push the dose more than, than Q12 in many patients. Sometimes big obese patients will use a higher dose, but that's a very small percentage of the, the patients. And then I developed a, a little program about 20 plus years ago, once daily aminoglycosides, and that was an opportunity to maximize efficacy, minimize toxicity, and this is the way that aminoglycosides are given in many parts of the world. And so that whole method was about optimizing the PKPD. And then one of the areas that we have been very focused on over the last 12 or 15 years is the beta-lactams. And the reason for that is, I'm sure, very clear to all of you. You know, the beta-lactams, the cephalosporins, the penicillins, the carbapenems, they are really the backbone of our treatment of serious infections for many of our hospitalized patients. And because of their great safety and their predictable PK, you know, most of them are eliminated by the kidney. So we know what their PK is going to be. We can do some different things with how we deliver them and really begin to change the antibiotic exposure pretty dramatically. So I included some slides to tell you about that. And just because I, I think it's of increasing importance,
And it's not an area that we work in every day, but we see some opportunities with antifungal optimization that I think just hasn't been paid attention to very well. People just haven't focused on, on, on some of these opportunities with antifungal. And this happens to just be some data with fluconazole, and it's not new data by any means, it's in the literature, but it's very clear. You know, fluconazole, very well tolerated. You can use very high doses, right? 12 or 1600 milligrams a day. And if you optimize the AUC, the exposure, relative to the MIC, you can drive efficacy. So these are great opportunities that we, we probably are not taking full advantage of from a, from a PKPD perspective. And I think fluconazole is a drug that, unfortunately, we, we underutilize now in the context of some other antifungal therapies. One of the, the focuses that we have had over the last decade or so is not to want to get people to optimize one medicine, but to think about disease states. And I like pneumonia because it comes in lots of flavors, you know, community and hospital related. And then we do a lot in our intensive care unit, so sicker patients that are, are intubated with potentially bad bugs, as you know. And so we see great opportunities, and we began to work with our pulmonary critical care doctors, you know, back in 2005. They approached us because they said, you know, we just don't think patients are doing very well with pneumonia, and, and we, 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 we need a little help. So we began to work with them, and the the way that people are talking about this now and the new stewardship guidelines are, are not to talk about disease state, but to talk about fancy words like syndromic approach. You know, we like that very much, but we also want people to understand that this is not a, an approach for just antibiotics. It really is about developing a best practice philosophy. And best practice has to do with lots of things, right? First, asking questions like, is it really infection? Do I have the right cultures? How do I use the clinical laboratory and maybe new technologies or perhaps interventions like Brock Alvila Lavage to get the best cultures? Have I used the right radiology tools? And then if you believe it's infection, you can move to saying what are the right agents for this patient and how do we optimize the agents. So it's, it's a very much a focus on process of, of care and best practice. And we think this makes a tremendous amount of sense. And I show you this with pneumonia because you know we use a lot of different drugs in pneumonia. And the idea is every drug you use when you get to that point you should be thinking about optimizing the PKPD of every single one of them. And so, you know, for us, perhaps not unlike you, when we think about these challenging pathogens, for us, it's generally the gram positives, including staph and methicillin resistant staph. And, and, and Pseudomonas is a major, major concern of ours in our ICUs. And so we're, we're very much focused on these, these groups of, of pathogens. And the concept here is that, you know, historically we have tried to advocate for vancomycin. As many of you know, tycoplanin is not available in the U.S. That's a completely different story, but it's not available. So many clinicians have tried to optimize vanco, but because of the potential toxicity of vanco, we tend to go very slow. You know, when I dose the patients, I start with 20, 25, 30 milligram per kilo up front. But many people dose with 10 or 12. And so you have low levels, ineffective levels, and then you escalate the dosing. But that's not on the best interest of the patient because you don't optimize the PKPD for some two, three, four, five days. And so, you know, a decade or so ago, we began to advocate for linazolid. And you know, when you're in country, when you're in, in a country like Brazil, you have to celebrate your local people. And this was a study that, 
that Dr. Dr. Kiefer did when he was visiting with our laboratory and one of my people, Dr. Cuddy. And what it shows, I think, very nicely, and again, it's not new data, it's older data, but it's applications, is still universal. When you look at different doses of these agents, vancomycin, tycoplanin, or linazolid, you see that these glycopeptides, even with different dosages, don't optimize the PKPD profile, where an agent like linazolid drives the potential for efficacy. And with its lack of renal clearance, you know, the predictive exposures are quite good. And so this is why we've advocated for linazolid in a variety of our patients. And we did this about a decade before the, the most recent national guidelines. You know, in 2016, we have the guidelines that said, oh my God, we should be using linazolid because it's the right agent to use versus vancomycin. We started that in 2005, 2006. So one of the messages with PKPD is that if you believe in it, you're probably gonna be using doses for many antibiotics and administration approaches that are not in the package insert. So that becomes somewhat challenging for you. But if you know the literature and you know the supportive data, then it makes using these te techniques very, very good. And in my hospital, the pneumonia program that, I, that I'm showing you was endorsed by the hospital. So this provides some protection for the clinical doctors because it's advocated on behalf of our patients. So it isn't a one doctor program, it's a hospital-based program. And it's part of doing the right thing, it's part of best practice. You know, the aminoglycosides, as I said, you know, they kill best when they drive the concentration higher. And so I developed the, the once daily program and uh, some years ago, and again, used in many, many parts of the world. But the, the idea was that we also, in the sickest patients, we use empiric therapy with aminoglycosides. And we still use the same program that I developed in the early 90s seven milligram per kilo of an agent like tobramycin. You know, we don't use too much emicacin because tobra is still quite potent for pseudomonas in our practices. But when you add an aminoglycoside to the beta-lactam, you get about 20, 30% more coverage from, a, from a getting the right therapy on board early. And so we advocate for that very, very much, and we still do that today. You see that we don't advocate for quinolones at my hospital empirically because there's a fair amount of resistance in enterics and pseudomonas. So it's not a high probability agent to use a Cipro or Levo in that setting. Okay, we don't use them empirically. And we talked about the beta-lactams and the flexibility of the beta-lactams. But one of the questions that has come up is in sick patients, how do I know what I need to give for the beta-lactams? So we and others have done several, several studies. This is a study on anti-pseudomonal cephalosporins, and it was keftazidine and, and kefepime data sets. And what we found was when you get about 50% time of the MIC in plasma, you know, not in, not in the lung, but plasma, because we know that drives lung, then you begin to optimize the efficacy of the beta-lactam. So that provides a real target for us to get PKPD. And then we did some additional work with our colleagues in, in France, looking at carbapenems and asked the same kinds of questions. This was meropenem, imipenem, doripenem. And what we found with the carbapenems was the plasma profile, having a time above the MIC about 20%, seemed to maximize microbiologic and clinical efficacy. And these data are not so different, the time above the MICs, versus what we see in animal models of infection. So it also began to validate some of the animal models. And that became very important you know, and it's a, a completely different lecture.
but we're using a lot of the animal models to define the doses in preclinical. So when these new medicines get to you, ceftolazone, tazobactam, keftazidine, avibactam, we're already choosing PKPD optimized doses. And it starts in the preclinical arena so that we can maximize efficacy when you see the patients. And this is the situation. So if you want to know about whether or not PKPD is going to be important for efficacy, you have to look at the MIC distribution for your isolates. This happens to be Pseudomonas with meropenem. But the point here is, is that there's a large population of organisms that have MICs that are not susceptible. But many of those MICs are 4, 8, and 16. And when we optimize the doses, I'll show you in a moment, from a PD perspective, we can target 4, 8, and 16. So what you have done is made that beta-lactam significantly more potent in vivo than it might be in vitro. And that's what drives success, right? Delivering sufficient concentrations to your patients. So if you don't know where your bugs live from a potency perspective, not just S and R, but SINR, talk to your clinical microbiologist and find out. Then you can drive some of the data relative to PKPD. And much of the focus for us with beta-lactams early on in my career was about increasing the dose or increasing the frequency of dosing. And, and that increases the PD profile, but it's not efficient, right? Many of you understand now, you've seen the literature, that changing the infusions is a really neat way to make many of these very good drugs better. And again, you're gonna see that many of the new agents that are coming forward, they actually have a, a, a prolonged infusion component to them. And the reason is to maximize PKPD when you see it in the clinic. And so continuous infusion, you put the drug in a bag, you hang it over 24 hours, you have to give a bolus dose, so you get people to steady state very quickly. And the drug has to be stable at room temperature, right, for 24 hours. And stable at room temperature means sometimes in Brazil it's a little bit warm, right? So the ambient temperature can be, you know, 37, 38, 39, right? A little bit warmer than me. But you have to ask about the stability. And historically the carbapenems have not been very stable. So one of the things that we have done is do more carbapenems by prolonged infusions. And we give them over three or four hours to maximize the time of the MIC. If you take this philosophy of infusion and couple it, put it together with higher doses, then you can begin to target those MICs that are above susceptibility according to the conventional package inserts or even the CLSI, right? Because the bug, the bug doesn't know what the laboratory calls it, SIRR. -R. The bug only knows if we deliver sufficient concentrations. So that's our job, to make sure we drive the exposures. And so I put this slide together for you because one of the questions we get a lot is, is continuous or prolonged infusion better? And the answer is, they're the same. If you give the same total daily dose, this happens to be data with Piperacil and Tazobactin, you give the same total daily dose, prolonged or continuous, it's always better exposure than giving the same dose by 30 minute infusion. So you will never do your patient harm. You'll never give them less exposure by using a PD technique. You will not do that. It'll only be better if you're using the same dose. So that should give us some confidence, right? Why not? Why not give the patient the best exposure possible? And there's data on, on, on prolonged uh, and continuous infusion. This is some work we did early in, in, uh, in, 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 in the 2000s with Piperacil and Tazobactam. This is another data set from one of my U.S. colleagues, 
and, and many people have taken this philosophy of prolonged infusions for Piperacil and Tazobactam makes a great deal of, of sense. Um, and this is a, a, a data set that we did some years ago when Gil Frittato was, was in my lab. And Gil, as you know, is one of your infectologists here in, in Brazil. And he was in my lab and he makes the point here with this paper that this PKPD isn't just Piptazo, it's all the Cephalosporins, it's all the Carbapenems, but what's important is if you know where your MICs are on the x-axis, you can begin to choose the regimens that are likely to maximize the PKPD profile. So if you have the laboratory data, you have the techniques, you know about the safety of these regimens. These are things that can be implemented pretty quickly. And when we implemented the programs in pneumonia, now again, this was back more than, more than 10 years ago now. You know, when we started using higher doses of these beta-lactams, two grams of meropenem and two grams of kefepime and higher doses of piptazo, four and a half, Q6, and we started doing prolonged infusion, people were like, oh my God, this is crazy. But the reason we did this is that, you know, we know what the MIC distribution is. We know that there's lots of PK variability in ICU patients. And one of the ways to maximize exposure and drive the efficacy is to use high tolerated doses given in a way that maximizes the PKPD. And then I, I just want to share with you that as the patients have reduced renal function, we do change the doses, but we always give prolonged infusions to maximize time of the MIC. And a really important point here is, is this one. I can't see the, wherever this is, this, right? Continuous renal replacement. How many of you use this in your hospital, right? Many of you, right? This is, is this, this is, this is challenging for me, right? Because many times when continuous renal replacement is being used in the US, in many parts of the world, the doctors make a reduced dose because they feel like, oh, patient's in renal failure. I need to give 20% of the dose. They, people are not aware that many times the clearance of these drugs is actually close to normal between the dialysis and the intrinsic clearance of the patient, their creatinine clearances are usually 50 or 60. And so if you give 20% of the dose, you're gonna give a woefully low dose. And so our protocol with beta-lactans is you give the full dose on continuous renal replacement and maximize the potential efficacy. You know, these are just the outcomes that provides the reference for you. You can look, a couple of my fellows have published this stuff. Whenever I talk about very aggressive dosing and optimizing PKPD, I also want to talk about stopping antibox. I don't want you to just say, oh, Nicolo said he gave a great lecture in Brazil, you know, in Sao Paulo. Give high dose. Don't pay attention to anything. No. Give the high dose. Be aggressive. Understand the bug. If it's not infection in day two, three, discontinue the antibox. And so that's part of our pneumonia program based on the BAL sterility, stop the antibiotics. Sometimes it's trauma. Sometimes it's, it's other things, pulmonary, not infection. Stop the antibiotics. The other is, if it comes out to be a very susceptible strain, refocus your antibiotics. And our intensive care doctors have been very good about doing this work. They're actually quite proud of their, their willingness to be aggressive but also their willingness to actually narrow the spectrum of antibiotics. And this is something you can do with your colleagues, right? You say, if you want the opportunity to use these new techniques and you're an intensivist, I will, I will advocate for you, but you have to be responsible and use the new tools appropriately. And our doctors have done a very good job about that. And then we see lots of patients like this at my hospital who get treated on antibiotics, do a little bit better, and then develop resistance and have clinical failure. And one of the questions that always comes up is, 
is this a host failure or is this a failure of drug? And in a situation like this where we're giving Kepapim one gram Q8 by not the prolonged infusion, the exposures are pretty low for some of these organisms like Serratia, understanding that the breakpoint MIC is eight microgram per mil. So it can be two insusceptible, it can be four, but it could be eight. And this one happened to be eight. So giving a very wimpy dose of Kepapim was not sufficient, even though it was reported as what? Susceptible. So you have to be aggressive, even with these susceptible organisms, unless you absolutely know what the potency of the antibiotic is. And so that's an important message with clinical failure. And then just a, a, a few points about, about just some of the challenges in the intensive care units and the idea that we see patients with high volumes of distribution, those patients with sepsis and septic shock. And you all appreciate the leaky capillaries, but bigger volumes of distribution dilutes out the drug at the target site. So giving low doses in this setting is not ideal. You've got to give aggressive doses. We have situations where we have reduced renal function, right? And sometimes we, we make the dose too small. The patient's renal function is better than we think. So be careful when you're making dose adjustments down, especially early in infection. And then we also recognize that there's a, there's a philosophy and, a, and an entity in the ICU that's being increasingly recognized augmented renal clearance, where these patients might have clearances that could approach double the renal clearance of other patients. They're hypermetabolic. And as a result, the drugs are eliminated quickly. So measuring creatinine clearances in the ICU, you know, over eight hours, being aggressive with the doses are very important. And agents like ceftolazone Tazo when we're giving these higher doses, three grams, we're trying to study these data to make sure that they get sufficient concentrations, even with augmented clearance. And then lastly, some new medicines that are being developed, we're encouraging the companies, actually, to develop a specific dosing regimen for augmented clearance. And so this may be the first medicine you see where it actually has a dose specifically for high clearance patients. And so we think that's important to optimize the PKPD. And then therapeutic interventions, right? Back to continuous renal replacement. And I, I won't go through this case with you, but this was a case we were called for the patient to see a 75-year-old man in the ICU and, and had a pneumococcal sepsis. And, and he did well from the pneumococcal sepsis, but developed another pneumonia. And despite us having the guidelines to use high dose, the ICU team used low dose. And it went from a very susceptible pseudomonas to a pseudomonas that was wildly resistant to everything. And, and it could have been prevented uh, by using the right doses up front, okay? So just to tell you that in the clinic, this happens to all of us, but these are things that we can try to avoid. And then lastly, I just have about five or six minutes. I, I wanted to talk about carbapenemase producing enterics. And this is an increasing area of interest to us. It's an increasing challenge to us. And you realize that these enterics are very prominent in both community and hospital acquired infections. And we understand that they come in lots of flavors. So, so I like to talk about the enzyme-mediated resistances. And we like all these things, NDM, right? VIM, KPC, OXA. These things are cool, right? But reason why it's cool is, as clinicians, you're gonna have medicines available where you can begin to pick and choose the medicine based on the enzymology, or perhaps combinations of medicines. So historically, we have all used Colistin backbones, right? And colistin, we know, is a horrible agent from an efficacy perspective and also a toxicity perspective. And none of us would use it if we had alternatives. And historically, we haven't. More recently, there's been an introduction of, of a couple of approaches. And I introduced an opportunity to use double carbapenem therapy, 
Any of you use double carbapenem therapy to manage your patients? So this was a program that I developed, you know, after seeing some, some patients, and it was, it was meant to be an intermediate. We didn't have new medicines. Colistin was bad. And I created this regimen to try to manage patients specifically with KPC. It works only with KPC. But, but all of that was about getting ready for all of these new inhibitors that are coming. And keftazidine AV Bactam has been available in the U.S. Meropenem Vaba Bactam is just recently released. But there are lots of different beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors coming. And keftazidine is registered in the country now, in your country. You know, it hasn't been promoted yet, not quite ready to launch. But, but it's an important agent to manage these patients. Why? Because all of the data that are being generated with these new BLBIs, and it's true of keftazidine and the others, the efficacy relative to colistin-based regimens is crazy high. The efficacy is good and the toxicity is low. So we're transitioning to BLBIs for obvious reasons. The beta-lactams are important. But I just want to show you this data set because some of my colleagues from Pittsburgh have also recognized with keftazidine AV Bactam that you can have the development of resistance on therapy. But the real important message here is the fact that all medicines can develop resistance. But if you look at the papers they published, there's two things going on. One is there's a mutation that's been recognized specifically with KPC3. So this is a very, very small subset of the carbapenemase producers. That's the first thing. The second thing is the patients that develop resistance were generally on continuous renal replacement getting the wrong dose. They got a reduced dose on CRRT. So back to the PKPD. If you're going to use these medicines, you've got to know how to deliver them. And whether it's keftazidine, maybe Bactam, or meropenem, or kefepime, if you use the wrong dose, you are likely to encourage resistance. So when this new medicine becomes available for you to use later, you know, in, 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 the, in 2019, you've got to understand the PKPD so that you can drive efficacy and minimize the potential development of resistance. This is some interesting stuff, and just the last slide or two, we got how many minutes? One minute, two minutes? Five, Five minutes. Oh, then I have 10 slides <laughs> for you. So this is the really cool stuff, right? The really cool stuff. And you know, maybe you can begin to call yourselves enzymologists, right? You, you are the doctors of infection, right? But you are also the doctors of the enzymes because the enzymes are our biggest challenge. So this was a patient we were asked to assist with who was in the south of the U.S. and this was a very sick patient who was having a, a bowel transplantation. So immunosuppressives, lots of, and she, she had a travel history and antibiotic history, but developed infection with a Klebsiella that actually had multiple enzymes. Right, it had the enzymes. Let me see if I can move this over here. It had the enzymes of uh, of the NDM, so metallo, had the enzymes of OXA, and then a little ESBL in there to round out the enzymology. Right, a CTXM15. And so, if you look at the antibiotic profile of resistance, these these antibiotics are wildly resistant. Right, there's there's, there's really no hope. The only agent that had any activity was tigacycline with an MIC of one, but we weren't going to use tigacycline alone. And so what we had begun to do was not only understand the molecular epidemiology, but one of the things that you can do with your clinical setting and with your laboratory uh, colleagues is you can begin to use various E-strips. Many of you know about the E-test or the lipophilchem test, these gradient strips. And what you can see here is this would be a very high concentration of antibiotic to a low concentration. And when you put keftazidine AV Bactam strip or you put a trianam strip on the, on the plate, no zone of inhibition. Because the NDM 
kills the Cartesian AV, right? And the Ashtrianum is killed by the OXA and the CTXM. But when you put them together, you know, something magical happens, right? What you begin to see is something here that we affectionately call the zone of hope, <laughs> right? Because you go from having no activity to a situation where using them together, you can actually mitigate the enzymology. And this is the regimen that we used in this patient, Keftacidine, maybe back to him, plus as Trinam, very successful in this patient, and many others now that have multiple enzymes. So these are neat things, and you can apply PKPD. This is another paper that's recently going to be uh, published in one of the ID journals from our group, but it just shows you the complexity of the enzymology. And sometimes, even if you don't have the molecular data, if you start to cross some of these strips in the laboratory, you can begin to find some reasonable therapies. And so the zone of hope is becoming more and more prominent, right? But it gives us an opportunity to, to drive medicines, to optimize PKPD and efficacy in patients that ordinarily you wouldn't have much in the way of therapy. So we think this is a nice mix of, of microbiology and enzymology and, and PKPD. So the last slide, you know, when you got sick patients, anticipate PK profiles. And the PK profile is going to be variable and oftentimes low for the reasons we mentioned. So you have to use more aggressive doses. Understand the, the MICs. If your MICs are very low, then sometimes the PKPD optimization is not going to make a difference. But if you're dealing with sicker patients and the enzyme and the MICs are here, getting it right up front is going to drive efficacy for you. And these are things that as doctors, you know, you can do. You know, you don't, you don't have to do anything heroic, but if you choose the right dose and you choose the right way to deliver it, you know, you can drive efficacy. We like the enzymology, as I said, my bias. I think this is very neat. And knowing the molecular epidemiology is increasingly important. And I know these technologies are increasingly available in many laboratories across the country. This is true in Brazil. But if you don't have these technologies, crossing the strips is a good way to begin to understand if using a medicine or two together will potentially drive efficacy. And lastly, you know, uh, the era of using one drug to treat many of these infections is, is probably coming to an end. So we routinely use combinations of antibiotics, even with BLBIs, because of the variation in PK and optimization, we, we, we're using combinations of therapies. And the best combination of therapy has to be determined based on your local epidemiology. But if you use combinations of antibiotics, be aggressive with each one to optimize the PKPD. Don't give a little of this and a little of this and hope for synergy. Maximize, maximize, and hope for cure. Thank you very much.